All right, let's go ahead and get started. Looks like we've got people from all over the world. I am looking at the chat pane. We've got Minnesota, Florida, Portugal, Utah, San Francisco, Charlotte, Chicago. Great. Welcome to everyone. Glad you all could join us. So glad everyone's here for the client success webinar today. I'm Mark Stoddard. I run sales and marketing here at Client Success. Happy to have Jay Nathan at Customer Imperative. He's going to be our guest today. Hey, Jay, how are you? Doing great. Thanks for having me, Mark. Very good. Yeah, we're glad to have you. Can everybody hear Jay also? I could hear him just fine. I'm guessing everybody else could. Looks like everyone's saying yes, so we're cool. good. All right. Um, don't want to forget, also, I've got Dave Blake, CEO of Client Success. He's on. He's going to be helping us out. Dave, can you hear us okay? Yeah, how's everybody doing? Doing good so far. So far, so good. Well, good. Um, all right. So, a few housekeeping items. We're gonna have. A, we're gonna do our best to make it a really interactive session today. I'll share more about that as we go. We're gonna have Dave share a couple things here at the top, and then he'll kind of give it back to us. And Dave and I will run the majority of kind of the questions um, or the session. But um, yeah, really looking forward to it. So, hey, Dave, how about uh, you jump in and, and share what you've got to say? Hey, everybody. We're thrilled to have you today for the next uh, Client Success webinar series. Um, grateful that you take time of your day to, to join us. And hopefully you're, you've been, uh, those who have been before, we're welcoming you back. Those who are new, we hope you uh, find these helpful and to be able to learn and to engage and to be able to um, just, just join as a community. I think at Client Success, the first thing we always want to say it here is that we hope that you and your family and your friends and, and colleagues are doing well. We hope that you're being safe. We know that this is a time of crisis. We'll talk a little bit about that today. Um, and we just, uh, we just send our best wishes to you um, from, from the Client Success family to you and your family and colleagues. Um, the next one is every, those who have been here, every time I wear a different client success shirt, this time I brought out the grit shirt. This has been one of our, our, fa our uh, most famous ones. Oh, and uh, and er this is a time for grit, man. If, if there's any time when, um, when people uh, need grit and uh, this is a time. And so this is our message to you today is hang in there, have grit. And in times like this, it's all about um, looking out and, you know, finding hope and finding um, finding the ability to, to help those around us. And we, we certainly want to do that. If we can be of help to anybody at any time during this, this period, please reach out to us because we'd like to be help, uh, of help to you. And uh, we hope you'll do the same. I think that's where I find great joy in these days um, when, when it's difficult. Uh, in that regard, this community, uh, customer success community is a tight community. We've had, um, unfortunately, we've had some, several of our colleagues throughout the world be impacted with layoffs. And we hope that if you are hiring out there that you'll look around and, and try to find one of your colleagues who've been laid off and, and try to find an opportunity for them. Client Success has a website, um, a page that has opening jobs. Jay, I know Jay and his team are doing a great job also supporting that. They send out a daily email, if I remember Jay, or a couple times a week of job openings. And so between, uh, between all of us, let's, let's go out there and try to find um, a customer success colleague and get them back to work and, uh, and take care of our customers. And the last thing is, um, is just thank you for, for the community. Uh, we're excited about it. Today, we're thrilled to have Jay. Jay's a great friend of their company, an awesome thought leader. His company, Customer Imperative, does just great thought leadership, uh, high-end customer success and SaaS consulting, and, um, and is doing a lot of great things from, from having office hours and several other things. I'm sure he'll, he'll share that today. Um, Jay, we're, we're thrilled to have you. We're stoked to hear what you have to say today, and thanks for joining us uh, today. Thanks, Dave. I'm glad to be here. All right, Mark, awesome. we're going to switch over now. All right, let's switch over here. Hang on a sec. I'm going to share just a, for those of you who this is their, this is your first time, um, I'm gonna, just going to give you a quick intro into client success, who we are, who, what we do, and then have Jay share a little bit, a little bit about uh, customer imperative, who they are, what they do. Um, so for, for those of you who don't know much about client success, we are a customer success growth platform. 
And so what our mission is, is to help customer success teams keep and grow their customers, especially important in these times. And so the way that we, the way that we do that, the way that we help those teams is we help CSMs get everything that they need done, whether that's helping to onboard customers, whether that's to drive adoption, whether that's to drive renewals, whether that's to drive growth, all the way through the customer lifecycle, our, our, our goal is to give CSMs everything that they need in order to, to drive retention and growth. And so we do that all at the same time, we're driving insights to the rest of the company and driving collaboration, because especially right now, it's not just customer success, it's not just the customer success team's responsibility to drive retention and growth, it's the entire company. So growth is a team sport, and so we're doing everything we can to, to drive that adoption and health and collaboration across the entire company. So if you want to learn more about it, um, feel free to shoot us a note. We're on Twitter at Client Success or just go to ClientSuccess.com, visit us there, read more about what we're doing, as well as reach out to my team, get a demo. We're happy to, to talk to anybody at, at this time. So um, that being said, let's let's switch gears and move on to today's topic. So really excited to have Jay with us. As Dave mentioned, great thought leader, does a ton of work. He's a, if you get nothing else out of today, make sure you're following Jay on LinkedIn. He's a great follow. I, one of the first things I check in every morning is what has Jay said on LinkedIn today? So if you're not doing that, do that. Um, he's got a great background um, and ton of thought leadership. He's worked with companies like Rain Focus, Snag, People Matter, um, and then all the clients that he works with at Customer Imperative. Um, for those that aren't familiar with them, um, they're founded in 2017. They partner with B2B SaaS companies, which is the majority of us on the call today. And really what they do is they help them scale revenue. And they'll do that by deploying customer success teams, customer success process, technology, everything you need to, to scale your customer success team. So with everything going on, we wanted to have Jay on because he's got a really unique frontline view into how everything going on right now is impacting teams kind of all across the industry. So he'll be a great resource. He'll have help answer your questions for your questions. Um, so Jay, Jay has a few things he's going to share at the top. And then what we're going to do is we're going to manage the questions in two different ways. So if you would like for, for instance, to ask a question, you want me to read it off and we have a chat about it, um, just pop that into the chat pane. And that's easy to do. I can already see we have a few questions in there. Um, so I can read off some of those. What I really encourage you to do though, which really helped us drive a bunch of engagement on last Thursday's webinar with Miranda, was um, if you have a question, go ahead and hit the, the raise hand button at the, bot, at the bottom of the Zoom. Um, I'll see your, I'll see your hand raised and then I can unmute you and you can ask your question there. And so we can have a good back and forth with that. So my guess is we'll have a mix of questions that I read off, questions that we answer live, but I'd really love for as many of you as possible to, to do that. So um, it, with that being said, um, let's switch over to Jay. I think Jay, you have a couple slides that you wanted to, to show, right? So let me go ahead and I'm gonna stop the share on my side. And you can share on your screen if that works. There you All go. All right, there we go. And just making sure, can everybody see my screen okay? Yeah. Awesome. Technology, it's supporting us. That's great. Well, hi, Working. everybody. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Dave. So good to see your faces. It's been a long time since we've met in person, but uh, hopefully we'll get a chance to do that again uh, by the fall, by CS100, I'm hoping. Um, so, um, I wanted to talk to you about just a couple of things today. And what, what I plan to do is talk for maybe 15 minutes here and then start opening it up for a discussion and see if we can get some back and forth going. But um, as, as Mark and Dave mentioned, um, we've been hosting a, a weekly CS leadership office hours meeting. And so a lot of the, the, the content that I want to share with you today has really come directly from some of the folks that shared uh, in that environment over the past couple of weeks. It's been really meaningful conversation. But I wanted to start with a quote from one of our uh, dear friends, David Ellen, 
um, who was on the call last week, and, and, and I'm going to sort of, I'm going to quote him and, and just sort of let you absorb these words. He said, there's a lot of things that we don't know about the current circumstances that we're in. But one thing that we do know for sure is that customers are going to remember who stepped up and helped them through these times and who didn't. Which vendors reached out, which vendors didn't, which vendors were trying to be flexible and which were taking hardcore positions. So in our decision making, we just need to remember that because it's going to be a lesson learned when this is all over. We're going to look back and, and say, how did we react? How did our competitors react? And the ones who acted in favor of giving services away and providing discounts where it was helpful, um, those are going to be the ones that are remembered when this is all over with. So, you know, David's one of those he's just one of those wise souls. And I just love those words that he said. Um, but I'm going to, we're going to sort of touch on a number of the themes in that, in that comment here quickly. And then I do want to encourage you to ask questions live. I think it'll make the, the conversation uh, much more meaty, but you know, right now we're in a crisis. Like there's no other word to describe it than crisis. We're basically experiencing the 2008 recession worse and faster. Um, so, you know, we have a, we have a big mountain to climb. I do believe we're going to get through it pretty quickly, but obviously we've got a lot to deal with now. So what I want to talk to you about are just three concepts, customer retention over revenue today, doubling down on your customer engagement, and then personalizing. I think this is the time to personalize. Okay. So um, we're just going to hop right in and, and we'll start off with uh, just systematic communication. So one of the things that you know, as Mark said, we're, we're, we're talking to tons of companies in the marketplace right now, trying to understand what everybody's doing and how they're responding. And then we're also talking to our own customers. So some of this comes from our own, um, our own direct experience. But, you know, what, what we see the uh, uh, most companies doing at this point is making an effort to contact all of their customers. And I'd say if you're not doing that yet, you're probably a little bit behind the eight ball on doing it. Um, so, you know, we're encouraging everybody to, to go ahead and, and do that. And that's going to prevent a lot of inbound for you. It's going to help people understand what's going on in your business, but it's also going to help you understand what's going on in their world, which is really important. And we're going to talk about that. Um, so, you know, on the call last week, we had um, a, a leader from the company Looker. Many of you know who uh, Looker is. A BI platform was just acquired by Google and they, you know, have, multiple thousands of customers and they are making an effort to contact every single one proactively. And the way they're doing that is they're not just spraying a big email out. They're actually segmenting their, their customers by geography. They're putting CSMs and other strategic resources that they have people um, on, you know, those, those customer segments and they're actually doing it in a very ordered and defined way. And they're, and they're tracking that through systems. So they've, they've automated the templates they've provided, uh, the starting point for those outreaches to happen. And they're also uh, tracking what they're hearing in response to that. And that's really important, right? So number one, we don't want to get inundated by flooding our email, our customers with email. Um, you know, maybe that doesn't even feel that personal, but number two, you know, we want to really track what we're hearing. Now is a great time to be listening to your customers. Okay. Um, and we've got to do that at scale. So it, it it's not like Dave and Mark and I, we can just go call all of those customers, right? So we need to be putting our CSMs on the front line, giving them the tools to track those conversations, um, but also getting back together. So roll that information up through your team, through your executive team, through marketing, through product, and try to understand what you're hearing in the market. We're going to talk in just a minute about a couple of ways that I think you can segment your customers right now to help sort of manage the volume and manage the, the communications, but it's so important that we be learning. Um, a lot of uh, the conversation or some of the conversation that's come up is we have a lot of salespeople right now who are not able to sell. So how can we utilize them? Get them on the phone with customers, give them an MBO so that they're helping us learn as quickly as we possibly can in the market, what we need to be doing for our customers. Um, personalization is key. So, you know, if we're doing an automated outreach to get somebody's attention, then make sure it's the same person that's, that's on the other end of the phone when, when that uh, customer does the, raise their hand um, and take us up on that, that uh, request for support. Um, some of you are in businesses that are booming right now. We know that there's a handful of industries which are just really inundated with business right now. And that can be almost as big of a problem as not having any business because you have to keep up with it, right? 
Um, yeah, I was talking to, how many to, of to us, one customer the other day that said all of their metrics have increased 5x in the last 30 days because they're a, in yeah. a remote collaboration. And yeah, you're exactly right. That's creating almost as many problems as it is solving. Right. And we got to keep up with that. We don't want to fall over, right? So just another thing you can do is proactively acknowledge that you may be having capacity issues, especially if you know that it's causing a delay and how you're reaching out to people. Um, but the format for all this outreach is pretty simple. Um, and I didn't make this up. I'm just relaying it to you. And it's really good though. It's number one, say hello. How are you? Not your company. How are you personally? You know, how's your family? Um, number two is, hey, just as a reminder, here are support options. Um, here's how you can get in touch, with, in touch with us for, you know, all your needs. We've gone remote, but we're still here to support you. Okay, and then number three is just allow them to book time with you, a human being, right? Not, not necessarily somebody looking to sell them something either, but um, somebody that can really help uh, answer their questions and figure out what the next steps are going to be with regard to your relationship. So communicate with your customers, be proactive, try to communicate with everybody. Um, the second thing, you know, I think this sort of dovetails into to what I mentioned a moment ago, but um, you know, a lot of people are, a lot of CSMs are trying to figure out how to engage and whether or not it is a good time to engage. And I would say, don't be bashful about getting in front of your clients if you're a CSM or if you're a manager of CSMs, let's, press our CSMs to get in front of clients and just, you know, it doesn't have to be a, an overly complex conversation as long as you're leading with empathy. Right. So again, how are you? How's your family? Do you have any aged uh, relatives that you're worried about? I can tell you right now in my house, it's a good time to, to compare notes with other people about what it's like to work with three kids in the house being homeschooled. Right, Dave, right, Mark. So <laughs> there, there's, there's a, there's, there's I sent them out for a drive right now while we're doing this <laughs> webinar. <laughs> I, know. I had to go tell everybody like, Hey, I'm going to be on the internet. Let's um, let me have the bandwidth for a little while. <laughs> no Netflix for a while. No Amazon for a while. <laughs> Same boat. Yeah. New, new normal hashtag new normal. Um, so, you know, th this is definitely a great relationship building opportunity and a time to do that. So do it now, you know, we'll, we'll be careful with doing that. We don't want to get in people's way, but I think people are looking to connect right now. So lean into that. Um, so of course we're going to leave with empathy. Number two, we're going to try to offer some value. So, you know, th there's a lot of ways that we can be creating value right now. And it may not all be through our products, like what Dave and Mark are doing here, hosting this podcast series, that's value to this community. And, you know, many of you have the same, you can provide the same kind of value in your domain for your community. And I bet you a, a bunch of you already are. Um, so, you know, in addition to providing community events and webinars and content, um, you know, we've got a couple of friends in the industry that are also taking their products and pivoting their products right now to provide value. So, um, you know, one of our, you know, a company that we're close with, Higher Logic, they're a, a community, um, online community platform for associations and for technology companies, but their association customers are especially hard hit right now because a lot of their revenue comes from on uh, basically live events and they're not able to hold those. So what they've done, Higher Logic has actually pivoted their product and said, hey, you can actually use our product now to run a virtual event and uh, for your association and we're not even gonna charge you for it for 90 days. So there's, you know, be creative about the kind of solutions that you can put in place uh, as a stopgap for your clients. They're going to remember that afterward. If you sort of think back to David Ellen's comment there, another friend of ours, Megan Bowen uh, works for a company called Platters. They do uh, basically delivery of food and lunches to offices. They're incredibly hard hit right now. Sure. Um, so they've pivoted that and they're doing in-home delivery now for team members. So everybody go and order food for your team um, there. But, um, but they've also got other offerings and solutions like prepaid credit, credit cards. They're using those things to build, you know, team and com camaraderie and culture right now when people can't meet face to face. So number two is find some value and deliver it. Do you have something to jump in there with Mark? I didn't want to cut you off, buddy. No, no, you keep going. That was, All right. uh, that was great. Cool. Um, and then, and then, the call to action. Okay. So this is, this part's a little bit more delicate and that's why I said maybe. Okay. So companies are either in one of three categories. They're 
they're thriving, they're, they're striving, or they're surviving, okay? If they're thriving, they're, they're booming. Like we may need to just support them, give them additional resources to make sure they can handle all the volume. If they're striving, they're probably cutting back like everybody else is, but they're actually taking this time to think about how they retool and how they prep for what happens after this crisis is passed. There's gonna be a lot of opportunity for them, okay? And then there's the surviving folks. If you serve the restaurant industry, for instance, you know that these are the, these are the companies that have lost a majority of their revenue. Like overnight, the revenue dried up. So they're just looking to figure out how and if they can stay in business. Those are probably the ones that we don't have a real explicit call to action with, right? We aren't gonna burden them, but we are gonna to try to provide them some flexibility. But above all, I'll go back to another point I made earlier. Let's learn from all these people, have these conversations, learn who falls into which, into which bucket. Maybe it's by industry, maybe it's by size, SMBs. We know we're gonna be particularly hard hit by this. Um, and, and learn and, and iterate your approach. Like this is the time for everybody to act like a startup. Um, I want to make sure I'm not missing any questions as we go here. Cool. Uh, yeah. If you want to jump into questions, uh, there, there, there are several questions that have come across. We can jump into there. You want, you, you want to switch gears to that? Yeah. Why don't we do that for a minute? Cool. So a few questions that have come across. One, a um, little bit ago from Jessup, who the first two questions actually are about specifically about the outreach. So in, in Jessup's questions, he says, how do you handle reaching out to clients for needs regarding deliverables? during a time of crisis? What's the best way to navigate this conversation without being perceived as being pushy? What are your thoughts there? Yeah, I, I think it goes back to what we've been talking about so far. And I think to be fair, Jessup asked this question before we talked about that, but you know, just try to understand where everybody is. And you know, this is, I can imagine that a lot of customers are in the middle of your onboarding process right now, right? And so you need things from them, but just realize that your onboarding process might not be the biggest fire they're putting out today. So just you know, lead with empathy, seek to understand, and then adjust your approach accordingly. Maybe you put them on hold for, there's a category of customers that you just put on hold for, you know, 30 days until they're in a better spot. Yeah, that's what I've seen, seen a lot of people do. Just reach out and they're like, I, we get that we're living in a different world than we were on March 1st. Um, how can I help? What, what The project we were working on, where does that rank in terms of priority right now? Has it shifted? Is it still, are we still all systems go? and then right. being flexible accordingly. Um, Maggie asks a question. So in their business, they reach out to, they kind of have key contacts that they'll work with at a business. And then they have another set of kind of other contacts or users. And so as part of the outreach, are you thinking you reach out to everybody that's using your platform, just your key contacts? Is it kind of a, it depends. What are your, what are your thoughts there? Um, yeah, I, I think in, in my mind, we're, we're probably connecting with as many as we can within an account. So I think of, of the, the contacts, um, the relationship with an account and the one, two, three methodology. I just okay. learned this not too long ago and I really like it and we've adopted it. So one executive sponsor, two champions, and then three users. And as long as I'm maintaining a relationship with all those different personas within my accounts, I can withstand the loss of any one or two people in any of those categories, right? So it's a really cool methodology. I think, um, you know, we're not really trying to push a commercial conversation right now. So really it's about making sure that our users are taken care of, our champions are taken care of, and then probably third, our, our executive sponsors are taken care of. If you need to talk to an executive sponsor about a contract, which we're going to talk about here in a minute, they're probably going to call you. So, you know, that, that's, that's, that's probably already going to happen if it, if it needs to. Um, but I would say try to connect with, with your customers, you know, holistically, if you can. Yeah, it, Jay, Jay, I was going to say, I love the one, two, three strategy. We, we, we typically talk about it as going high and wide in the organization. So I, I've got to go up to my executive sponsors, but I also want to go wide on this, on the breadth of the users. And it's just a different messages. Potentially you start with empathy on both, but then, um, it just def different types of messages. Obviously, you're gonna you're gonna engage with your executive sponsors versus the users at this time. Uh, but I but I but I agree, both are important. Totally. And if you have value to provide, like you may be learning things from other customers who look a lot like your other customers. And so, if you can bring that value and sort of share best practices across, like there there's a, there's a ton of um, 
value in that for, for the customer now, but you know, you as a facilitator of that long-term, sorry, I talk with my hands and I just hit my microphone, but there's a lot of value for us long-term to be facilitators like that. So, yeah. What, what, what are your thoughts on, so there's two questions here related to effectively, how do you handle when a customer goes dark? I mean, one of the, one of the questions here is, look, we work with IT staff at hospitals. I'm probably not their top priority right now. Um, and so, you know, what, what are some advice, some, some best practices when we're, when we're trying to reach out, we're trying to, you know, do the one, two, three, or wh wh whichever model you're talking about, but I'm just not getting any response. Maybe they're not even opening my emails. What are your thoughts? I think this is battlefield triage to some degree. And if I'm emailing somebody, especially in the healthcare industry and they're not responding, I think we all know why that is right. Because they're pro nobody's in front of their email is what I'm guessing. Right. Or nobody's bit, yeah. in front of zoom or their desktop. Um, now that, that may be, you know, this is it, you know, hospital it. So it could be different, but you know, again, I think, you know, they're prioritizing just like we are. Right. So, so if a customer is going to reach out back to you and engage with you, then start with the ones who will talk to us. Right. And let's, let's work with them. Let's learn from them. But I think we have to respect that, that, that some industries, particularly that one have their hair on yeah. fire right now. And that's even shared that's, some things with go ahead, Dave. I was going to say that's part of the empathy right now is recognizing where the, where they are and where they should be, where their focus should be and saying, all right, I'm not going to bother them now. Maybe it's something else where you send them, uh, you send them a note uh, and thank you note. And Hey, we've got, thank you for having your, our back and help contributing this time. There's other ways that you can um, get a, a valuable touch point without kind of cool bothering them when, when there's other things that are more, more important right now, but we'll show you that you're being empathy, empathetic and that you're, um, that you care about them as an individual. Yeah. And oftentimes it's like, think about like, if your standard playbook says reach out, schedule a 15, 20, 30 minute meeting to have an account review and they're not getting back to you, make it easier for them to reply to you, make it easier for them to, to get back to you. Sometimes it's, you know, I'm going to shoot this note out. I haven't heard back from you. I'm assume it's because you're running around like crazy and you're trying to figure out, you know, which way is up right now. Reply with a one word response so that I know you're still something along those lines. Just make it easier for them to reply to you, give you some insights so you can, so, so you can make sure that you, you've got a little bit of insight, but don't go necessarily trying to schedule a 30, 60 minute account review if that's not appropriate right now. Totally. And don't, don't take it personally if they don't respond. Yep. 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 Um, so Dimpy is asking some questions around, and this is going to be, the, 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 there's a bunch of follow on questions that come after this. He's asking, um, you know, how do you respond to cancellations and discounts in a time of crisis? And I think a lot of us are seeing some version of People trying to cancel, people trying for discounts, people asking for more flexible payment terms, people asking uh, overall just kind of flexibility because they're in a, you know, a, a cost cutting mindset. Um, are you having those conversations right now? Do you have a playbook that you're advising clients on? How do you, how are you thinking about that? Yeah. So this is a good, a good opportunity to sort of pick the, pick the presentation back up. So I'll do that. Um, Great. You know, I think um, what, so that there's a handful of contractual options that we see companies offering right now. But, but even ahead of that, you know, what my advice is, is be prescriptive about this and don't, um, don't let the customers come to you and you customize it for every single one because A, you're going to spend a lot of time doing that and B, you're going to be sort of dragged down a path that's, that may not be mutually um, respective of the business situation that you're in as well, sure. right? So um, there's, there's really, and th these came almost directly from our office hours meeting last week, um, but the, there's really about really three main flavors of how folks are doing this. So option number one for contracts is that we're heavily discounting folks to stay over the next 12 months and then putting them back on standard pricing after that, that term. So, you know, that's a tactic you could use if you're close to renewal, for instance. Um, the second one is, I, I don't know, I called it pause and extend, right? So 
we're in the middle of a contract or you know, even getting ready to renew, can we just give them three months of breathing room right now, no payments, just and extend the back end of that contract out by three months on the other side? Um, you know, right now, the, the issue is not, I mean, yes, the issue is dollars um, and, and money, but more than anything, it's uncertainty. So it's hard for anybody to think about what life is going to look like 30 days from now, much less a year from now or two years from now. So I think we got to be really careful trying to use this situation to lock our clients in. Like, we'll give you something for free now, but you got to give us something later because mm -hmm. it's hard for them to commit later because they don't even know what tomorrow is going to look like. Um, and, so and my advice on that one especially is make sure that whatever decision you make, you have your finance team involved as part of that solution part of that conversation because you know we were talking to a to a company the other day they're they're an early stage company they're a, they're a seed or a series a i forget which where they were but you know they cash is a little bit on a tight cash is tight for them right now and so offering all their clients a three-month reprieve isn't necessarily an option for them because they also have to balance the business needs while balancing being empathetic to customers so um the, the don't think that like everyone needs to be doing the same things. You got to come up with the right solution. That's right. Not only for your business, but also for your customers. A hundred percent. And you and I should do webinars more often, Mark, because you team me up. Perfectly <laughs> for these things. Um, but so the other thing is don't like, I've got one more option here. So the third option you could do is think about payment terms. Maybe instead of an annual payment, go down to semi-annual quarterly or even monthly, right? Which makes the increments a lot smaller. But the other idea, and I think it really matches with what you said, Mark, is don't try to peanut butter spread whatever dollars you can concede. Don't spread them across your entire customer base necessarily, right? What you want to do is try to target those companies that you feel like you're going to need later. We need all of our customers later, but the ones that are likely to remain with you after the crisis, but have no revenue today, like let's prioritize them. If they've lost sure. everything, prioritize them first and then explain that to your other customers, right? If I have a customer that's in an industry that's doing relatively well right now, or they've prepaid for the year and we're halfway through that right now, like let's kick that conversation down the road a little bit and help them understand like, hey, we're just like everybody else, we're prioritizing the most needy in our ecosystem. And we're gonna start there and that's what we're doing. And then, you know, we're going to have a conversation with you in three or six months and, and you know, let you know what that looks like. Um, so totally, Mark, I think your point is, is really good. And, and pre-plan, this is not something that the customer success team is generally going to do without involvement from finance, maybe even CEO, um, you know, maybe even the sales leadership team. Um, yeah, so there the needs CEO's to be not a involved process. in this conversation at this point, I'd say. That, that's a big question mark. I think every CEO is involved in these conversations this, this month. Yeah, I'd go back to uh, Jay, what you said at the beginning, and I think David's saying in the Q&A right now that, that people will remember how, how you treat them during this time and who has their back. And I'm a big believer in karma and what goes around comes around. And so this is our time to, to be flexible and be helpful. And, um, and show our customers that we care about them first. And, and, and hopefully that, I, I believe that that will ret return dividends down the road uh, multiple times over. Totally. And it, like I said earlier, we right now, and, and I gotta give David credit for this because he said it so eloquently, but we want customers, right? We, we need customers at the end of all this. And it's gonna be way more expensive to go acquire a new logo to replace one that we lost during the crisis than it is to just have that customer ready to go and maybe even have a game plan as to how we're going to accelerate our relationship together once this is all passed. So I think it's a huge opportunity to build that ecosystem. So hopefully that answers, you know, at least give some ideas and maybe not answers, but give yeah. some ideas about what other folks are doing in the market relative to, to contract flexibility and that type of thing. And just, just a reminder to everyone, I'm happy to continue to, to read the questions. If you want to have your hand, if you want to ask your question live, just go ahead and raise your hand um, and I'll unmute you. Um, had a bunch of those last time. Haven't had any raise your hand yet, but um, if, if you want to switch to that, that's cool. Um, Hannah shares an interesting one here. So she says, we're fortunate to have a software that's thriving at the moment. 
Um, we've pivoted our product slightly to cater to the highest needs in this situation. So what tactics would you recommend to manage expectations of those clients who were promised product roadmap A a month ago, but we've now shifted in the light of COVID-19 to product roadmap B? How do you go back to you know, these customers and have that discussion? What's, what's your advice there? Well, um, I think everybody's going to have to be prepared to have their cheese moved a little bit right now, but I also get making customer commitments. I think we just need to be transparent and proactive in how we go have that conversation and acknowledge that things have changed. Just like if you're, if you're really busy right now, um, you need to acknowledge that you might be having volume issues and it may take a little longer to get like if anybody's tried to, I don't know who's traveling, but anybody try to call American airlines or Delta right now, it, it takes a little while to get through. Yeah. Um, same, same thing. Right. So just, I think it's just all about being empathetic of where they are. And then also, um, just, you know, unapologetically being authentic and transparent and clear about where you have to go right now and why. Mm -hmm. And I think they'll, they'll respect it. Yep. Agreed. Um, so a couple other kind of tactical questions, um, you know, you talked about asking about feedback, um, or reaching out. Are you typically right now reaching out via email, phone? Are there specific types of like feedback mechanisms that you're recommending clients use? Are you saying is now the time to be sending NPS CSAT surveys? Is now the time to be, you know, reaching out via email? What are your, what are your thoughts there? That's a great question. So whenever you're sending surveys or, or requests for feedback on your company, one of the principles of that is you always want to be asking at a time that's good for the customer. Okay. We tend to do those things when it's good for us. It's not always good for the customer right now, more than likely it's not good for the customer, right? They're not going to be able to give it their full attention. They're probably going to ignore it. So your response rates are going to be abominably low anyway. Um, so, you know, I, I think to the extent you have some of this stuff automated, you can just let it run, but also think about the impact that you're having. You don't want to seem tone deaf to your customers about what the heck is going on here. So, you know, maybe just shut it off for now. Um, I think most of the communication and I, I would love to hear some, there's probably some opposing opinions to this and I'd love to hear them, but sure. um, I think most of the communication should be very personalized right now. So even if we are, initiating the conversation in mass with like a, an e like a mass email mark from you to, you know, a segment of customers. Mm -hmm. um, I think you should be responding if they raise their hand or come back to you, right? You should have a personal response to that if they do respond. Um, so that's my thoughts. I'd, I'd love to hear what other folks think about sure, that. Sure. Yeah. David here mentions, he, he kind of puts in this quote that says increase the bandwidth. So when increase the bandwidth when there are problems. So if you normally email phone, cause that's maybe easier to get across. If you normally call text, do video as possible. So do it, whatever you can. His advice is just, you know, increase your bandwidth as, you know, if at all possible. So let's yeah, see here, like Ben, that. let's see what Ben mentioned. So he says, sharing a little bit of what we do here. So Ben's customer of ours, a company called Tiny Clues. And he says, um, what they do is they define the guideline with their executive team. So they get their CEO, CFO, COO to give the guideline. And then the autonomy is to the CSM to have contractual discussions with the clients. So kind of at, at the executive level, they're kind of setting the guardrails, setting the playbook. Here's the general kind of levers you can pull on, um, but then it's up to each individual CSM, account manager, et cetera, to kind of, you know, drive the point home. And I think that's, I think that's a best practice in, in any time, right? I mean, in, in any time, any company that I've been a part of, you always have, you know, the, the go-to-market plan, the compensation plan, et cetera. That's defined at the leadership level but then you have a certain amount of levers that everybody on the front line can, can pull on. And I saw my, my thought process there is whatever you defined at your sales kickoff in January or at your revenue kickoff in January, probably go back and, and reassess those levers um, and see, are those still the right levers that everybody can manage to, um, or do we need to reassess those? What are your thoughts? Totally. I think if you haven't reassessed them now, you're probably behind the eight ball. Um, with, with a contract, there's, there's a handful of levers. You've got scope, 
you've got the length of the term, you've got the prices for the solution, you've got the, the payment terms. And so there, there are a number of different levers that we can pull to um, make those things, to, to make things work as a partner to our yeah. clients. But every single one of those has, a, has, a, has an impact and a consequence, right? So mm-hmm. of course, payment terms probably being the most critical for our business, like what does our cash flow look like? Sure. Um, so that's why it's so important to, to get agreement on what levels of flexibility we can provide because there's you know, probably a limit to that in, in most businesses um, one way or the other. And then what, sure. you know, what are the things that we can give away that don't break the bank, but provide a ton of value to our client. Mm-hmm. Can we bump everybody up to the next package level? For example, okay. does that break us from a cost perspective? I don't know. Mm-hmm. That's different for everybody's business, but you know, something to consider. Yeah, exactly. So it looks like we got a hand raise from Jessup. So Jessup, if you're still there, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you and allow you to talk so you can ask your question. Jessup, if you can hear us, you should be able to, to talk now. Cool. Awesome. Uh, thanks, guys, for putting this on. Really appreciate it. Um, you got it, man. Where are you calling in from? I'm, uh, I'm calling in from Orlando, Florida. I'm with a uh, startup called Flex Engage, and we actually support uh, the retail industry. So we're, we're dealing with a little bit of a crisis as well. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, amazing. everyone is, but, but we're sure, feeling sure. it uh, pretty well right now. Um, I guess just because of uh, the personalization talk, I wanted to hear about maybe how you guys are doing and, uh, and maybe just, you know, from that, what are some pain points that you guys are like personally seeing just with your companies? I'll let you go ahead, Mark. Sure. I'm going to, I'll let Dave jump in on that one. <laughs> hey, uh, Jesse, is it Jesse or Jessup? Jess up, Jesse, anything you want to go yes. for, it's all good. For <laughs> Thanks for joining. Hey, we're, um, you know what, we, I feel like that uh, our, our company has, um, the team is, as a whole has adapted to the reality very, very easily and very, uh, in a very optimistic and positive way. I, I couldn't be happier with the response from our team. As a leadership team, we've really tried to be transparent and try to get ahead of things. Um, internally first, because I think as, as a company, you've got to make sure your, your employees are taken care of so that, and if they're taken care of, they will then have that same care for, for their customers. And that's what we really tried to do. We've tried to uh, do our best to, um, to be more, have more communication, more standups, uh, adjust to the new normal, and then extend that empathy and, and concern and care for our customers. But, um, and I'd say the last thing we've really tried to do is um, it, it, this is tough. So we're not only trying to support each other, but we're also trying to look out outward, even beyond our, our um, customers and, and the client success world and say, how can we do our part in the bigger good of, of this crisis? Um, from a business standpoint, I think we're like everybody else. I think all, all businesses right now um, uh, do uh, smart aspects of hunkering down but also you see customers that are impacted in different ways. Some of our customers are thriving because their business is, is taking off from this and they need more help because they're thriving. And other companies are, um, are declining sharply and, and unfortunately some going out of business. And so, but there's also a good um, a bit of companies that I feel like is, is kind of getting back to the new normal and they're carrying on. And so that, that's kind of how I would say, uh, the, the perspective is from client success. We're really optimistic. We're trying to stay focused and come out of the other end of this as, as a stronger company and, and have learned a lot through the, through the experience. And I'd say, I'd say the only thing I'd add to that is we're, we're, we're constantly assessing day by day. I mean, we, we have a leadership stand up every morning, a 15, our entire leadership team gets on and you know, it's, it's what's changed in the last 24 hours. And over the last two weeks, there have been days where significant changes have happened, you know, in the last 24 hours. And how are we dealing with that? And, you know, we're having open discussions and dialogue, not only around, you know, our business, our customers, but also trying to get a sense of, you know, what's going on for those of us that are in the U S you know, Congress is passing different things and we're trying to get a sense of, you know, how that impacts our business or whether those are things that, you know, we could take advantage of or not. And so, I mean, it's, it's a matter of making sure that even more than usual, you're being open, you're being transparent, you're over communicating and probably talking more than you would have in the past, um, just because so many things are changing day in, day out. Anything you'd add there, Jay? 
No, I, I think that you guys said it well. I, I'd put us, so, you know, we're a little bit different. We're not a SaaS company. We're more of a, a, a services or a consulting organization. We do, you know, consulting and analytics for our customers. But, you know, we're, I'd put us in the striving category. Like, we, we see a very bright light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, but like everybody else, like, we're, you know, our, our pipeline is not as healthy as it was even three weeks ago. Right. Sure. So, um, you know, we're trying to figure out how to, how to conserve and then also how to shore up, you know, our, our business so that we can live to fight another day, which I'm confident we will, but you know, different, different companies are in different situations. We are probably both great examples of SMBs. Right. And so, uh, to the extent that folks on this call are serving small, medium sized businesses, like we, you know, we are, we are your target audience. And so, um, you know, it's, it's, it's good to know that, that you know how, how we're responding so it's a good question awesome cool. thanks guys you thanks guys. Jessica. thanks for, Take thanks care, for man. chiming in so i'm gonna put you on mute and then melissa looks like you've raised your hand to talk so i'm gonna unmute you real quick and you can go ahead and talk are you there hang on a sec did it should be able can to, you hear me yeah there she is hello hello hi jay how nice to nice to see you again jay Hi, uh, Melissa. <laughs> Old friends, huh? Um, yeah, we've we've spoken a couple times here. Cool. And where, so where, where, are you, where, are you, where are you located? I'm in uh, Easton, Pennsylvania, and I'm actually in yeah. transition right now. So I wanted to make a comment about, you know, how, how you view companies that are taking care of their employees, how they're taking care of their customers and everything, because... You know, being in transition, it's a unique situation where now I've got to find something to, to support my, my home. And I'm sitting there looking at these companies and I'm watching and seeing how they're reacting to, these, to this crisis, to this new world that we're living in. And I'm looking at it and saying, do I want to work for a company who's reacting this way or that way? You know, how do I want to, how do I want to go? Where do I want to go? You know, what fits with my values and things? So it's, it's critical from a company perspective, what's visible to their potential employees down the road, how they react to this. It, it all is a big representation of their culture. And if they're immediately first thing you're going to do is chop, chop heads. Well, do you really want to go work for a company that's like that? As soon as they hit a bump in the road, they start chopping people out. Or do you want somebody that sits there and says, Hey guys, buckle up tight. Here we go. And off they go. And whatever that road brings them, they're going to handle it. I'm going to go with the company that's going to, going to go and handle it. I don't want to go for a company that's going to sit there and immediately just start chopping heads and to the point of it costs more to go get a new customer than it does to retain your customer. If your recurring revenue stream is bringing in 60% or more of your annual revenue, you are foolish, absolutely foolish to do anything but sit there and protect that recurring revenue. So when I see him yeah. not wanting to support that, that side of it and protect sure. that recurring revenue and do everything that they can to do it, it really makes me quite upset and things that I can't say right here. Hey, Melissa, <laughs> I, I'll, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll respond real quick. First of all, <laughs> thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, and this is a tough time. We recognize that with, for, for you. And, um, but we think we, I, I'm grateful for the rawness and the, um, the, uh, the, the ability to, to, to share that with us. You know, this is, this is tough times. I think everybody's trying to make the best decisions that they can uh, and hopefully, and, and some of that means that they, um, they make uh, very quick decisions that impact employees um, because, because of the uncertainty, because of somewhat of the, the follower mentality that we have. Um, but, but I think that this time will really um, show um, leaders will rise to the top here, companies will rise to the top here, and employees, people will rise to the top. 
And um, that's why kind of we say, hey, we got to look after each other. We also need to have a people first mentality. And where possible, I, I really hope that um, leaders and CEOs will do everything they can to preserve uh, jobs and preserve and take care of their people during this time. That may, that may um, happen in very different ways. It may be that everybody has to um, take a, a small hit to, to, to survive together. It may be that you cut, they cut out other non-discretionary benefits or, or, um, or expenses. Um, it's just, I think that it's just to recognize that uh, very, very difficult decisions are being made across every business. And um, hopefully, I trust that most CEOs out there, most leadership teams are doing everything they can to preserve uh, jobs and, and preserve, uh, you know, put people first. Um, I, I know that's not always the case, but I, but I like to believe that um, in the rooms and in, in the in those deep conversations where they're making the tough decisions that they are, um, they're doing their best to do that um, uh, for the most I part. I hope so. I but, absolutely yeah. hope so. But thank yeah. you for the uh, authenticity <laughs> and the, uh, the, uh, the, the, that you shared there. It, it is, that's a reality of many people's lives and probably several, many on this call. And, um, but, uh, but hopefully we can get through it. And, and I, I trust that you'll have a great, wherever you land next, will be a great place for you and you'll contribute significantly there. So we wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank cool. you, Melissa. Thanks, Melissa, appreciate it. Um, so let's see here, We're, we've got about eight minutes or so left. So um, maybe we'll take one or two more questions and then we'll go ahead and wrap things up. Um, let's see here. So, so Sherry asks a question that I think is applicable not only to her, but to a lot of us. And what she's saying is she works for a software company in South Africa that services the tourism industry. So most of the lodges, most of the lodges across the entire continent have either closed until further notice and been forced to go on leave, et cetera. So I guess for her or I guess for anybody else that's selling into a really hard hit industry, be that restaurants, tourism, um, and any of those that fall into that, or what were our buckets? Thriving, striving, and what was the third surviving. bucket? Surviving. Surviving. You know, just kind of, you know, any kind of last piece of advice that you'd have for those that are focused on, on working with customers in those, those surviving industries. Yeah, I, I mean, I almost feel like I got to put my CMO hat on. By the way, I don't have a CMO hat. I'm not a marketer. Um, <laughs> but if I'm thinking about it, my, 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 how do I stay engaged with those customers in some way, knowing that they're not going to talk to me about services right now? Uh, but can I go, you know, interview the people that were my customers and share their stories with the rest of my audience? You know, maybe, maybe that's a way to just keep people engaged in your brand and actually, you know, find ways to help them that aren't even related to technology at all, if you can afford to do it, right? I, I don't know that you can, but um, I think it becomes more of just a community engagement. How do you build engagement and provide value outside of your software completely? So that, that's my gut reaction. I don't know if you guys have other ideas, Mark or Blake. Uh, Dave. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Blake, okay. I got two first names too, so hey, it happens dude. to me all the time. Yeah. <laughs> I call my either. Go ahead, Mark. Um, I guess I mean it's it, it's everything we've been talking about. It's you know it's it's making sure that but part of that is making sure that you're reaching out, you're empathetic to, to everything that's going on. Um, I really like the idea of figuring out ways to. Um, offer more value right now, not necessarily cutting across the board. And so whether there are, you know, additional consulting, whether there's additional products you can sell, whether you can treat this as, a, as an opportunity to, to go back to customers and, and retrain those, those customers that are not using it, especially if you're using a product that, that can help. If, you can, if you're using, a, if you're selling a product that can help them get through this, that helps increase efficiency, that helps increase customers. Um, there's an opportunity to, to turn around and really double down and focus on, yes, we, we, we tend to be our first, you know, our, our, our first focus tends to be how can we cut, 
but also how can we how can we drive value? How can we set somebody up that where over the next three months maybe we have to provide some flexibility, but at the same time, how do we play offense with them to help them come out of this even stronger on the back end? And so those are some of the things I'd be thinking about. Any other thoughts? All right, there's one last question here that I want to get in because it's interesting in that it, it, it's a different angle on everything we've been talking about. We've been talking a lot about, you know, how do you, how do you manage customers? How do you help customers? Um, Steve asked a question here that's much more operational. So, um, inevitable, you know, it's, it's inevitable that, you know, a lot of our companies are going to face churn issues due to budget restrictions or whatever over the next, you know, X period of time. So since this is the case, um, how are you thinking about, or Jay, how are you seeing your clients thinking about their CSM comp plans? Like if they had a CSM comp plan that was tied to X amount of growth, Y amount of attrition, et cetera. Well, in a world in which the economy has shifted, are you seeing clients get to the point to where they're, they're proactively adjusting comp plans and targets yet? Or do you kind of see that as the next step after people kind of get through this first wave? What are you seeing? Uh, that's a great question. And I don't, I haven't actually talked with anybody and it doesn't mean that it's not happening, but I haven't talked with people where that's been like the first topic of conversation, but I think we're getting to that point now, right? Where the people who are keeping their CSM teams intact are going to have to figure out, okay, if we had an 80, 20 bonus plan, meaning 80% base, 20% variable, like, are we like, how are we going to, what metric are we going to use to decide what that 20% looks like? Yeah. Um, you know, I think we've got the same dilemma with our sales teams right now, probably even yeah. more pronounced because they're going to be 50, 50, 60, 40, 70, 30. So I think, um, you know, my mind goes to like, how can we put a set of MBOs in place management by objective, like, and let's aim for a hundred percent coverage over our customer base. Right. And then track who we're making contact with, what the disposition of those accounts are. Again, do it in the, in the CRM or in your CS platform. Don't, we're not going to do this willy nilly, but actually track those things, track the relationships that we're building and cultivating during this time, because that's the most valuable thing we can do right now. And so if we're doing that, we're not going to make money for it this year, but it's going to translate into our revenue story for 2021 and 2022. So that's my, that's, that's my gut reaction to that. Yeah, I'd say the same thing. I'd say that uh, certainly if, especially if they're adjusting um, quotas on the sales side, certainly CSM should, should uh, be in consideration. Right now, uh, I think all companies are being flexible and are, are making adjustments. Um, there, some are, are bringing down um, their uh, forecast for the year, et cetera. And certainly that should flow to, to the CSMs um, in that regard. The other thing we're doing is, um, you know, we're, we're, we're part, part of the, you know, we have some customers that are impact and they're going to ask us for flexibility and, and, and different things like that. Um, and just like you have churn reason codes previously for other reasons, um, you should have a COVID-19 churn reason code. Uh, you should link back all the, the impacts of your, of your customers back um, and be able to quantify that. And, and, and you can use that for um, learnings for uh, to be able to, to share that with your with your leadership team and make decisions like this uh, with comp plans and other decisions uh, for, uh, for the for the um, for the company. Cool, very good. Um, we're gonna we're gonna go ahead and wrap. I'm gonna share a couple of final words. Um, Jay, any any final words that you want to share with uh, with the group? Uh, no, I just appreciate appreciate everybody joining today, and thank you guys, uh, Dave and Mark, for for the opportunity to to convene this this crew. So. Appreciate it. Yeah, thanks. Good to see yeah, you. I really appreciate you taking the time. I think we got a ton of value from it. And for those that um, have been kind of following the emails, this is part of a webinar series. And so this is the third in our webinar series. So um, we're doing them every Tuesday, Thursday at uh, noon mountains, 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 o'clock Eastern. Um, and so really appreciate everyone that joined. We've had, you know, probably, you know, north of a thousand people that have actually signed up for the series at this point. And so there's a bunch of you that are joining live, a bunch of you that are viewing the recordings afterwards. I will be sending out the recordings as well as we're posting it to our YouTube channel. Um, for the next few, few weeks, you'll see we have Julie Persofsky from Winning by Design. So she's going to give us another talk. Um, I'm still working on the final details of, of her topic, but it's going to be really impactful. Um, Jim Callback, uh, client success customer, 
and um, runs uh, runs customer success for a company called Mural um, that's uh, got some really interesting things that are, that are going on right now. And um, we're also in the mode of considering whether we should continue this. So we basically initially, when, when Dave and I decided to do this, we said we're going to run this for three weeks and kind of see what happens. And if you're getting a ton of value from it, please let us know and we'll continue it if there's you know enough people that are, that are interested and excited for it. So uh, maybe pop them in the chat pane or shoot me a note um, or give us a shout out on Twitter if you'd like us to continue. Because if, if you'd like us to continue, we'll, we'll definitely do it. And just a couple other things, um, we'd love to see more examples out there of companies showing customer love. So whether if you're in B2B SaaS or whether you're seeing them in any industry, we've seen a, a bunch of examples of companies going above and beyond for their customers. And so if you see that, whether that's one of your customers, whether that's in a related industry, if you're seeing examples of that, we'd love to see it if you just post it on Twitter or on LinkedIn, mark it as hashtag customer love. We'll retweet it. We've seen some really cool stories already. Love to see any more. And I guess maybe the final thing is if you know any of your customer success teams are looking for help to manage your operations, if you're looking for help to manage a now remote customer success team, because we've all been switched into that, and you need help with your processes, you need help with your collaboration, you need help with making sure that your team is on the same page and driving all the right activities. Um, please reach out to us. We'd love to be able to be a resource for you. And if we could potentially help your team during this time, please reach out to us. We'd love to be able to help. Again, meet us at clientsuccess.com or on Twitter at Client Success. And in that case, if there's no other words, really appreciate everybody spending the time with us today. Thanks to Dave, thanks to Jay. Any final words that anybody wants to share? Just take care of yourself, take care of your customers, and uh, let us know if we can help. Thanks, Jay, for joining. Good to see you guys. Thank you all. Take care. All right, cool. Thanks, everybody.